Now, what could possibly go wrong when a practically homeless, polyamorous himbo in a night costume attempts to crowdfund his artistic endeavors, which seem to almost always lead to alcohol-led partying and situationships with his co-stars? Are you kidding me? That's a recipe for disaster. That is, if that's the only lens you look at this through. I'm being facetiously reductive in my summary here, but this is a very serious issue that is affecting the cosplay, gaming, renaissance community as it pertains to some very serious and heavy accusations being levied against someone. This has led to yet another trial in the court of public opinion, which includes not only a campaign to cancel this man and strip him of his livelihood, but threats against his life as well. Threats endorsed by some pretty big content creators. Before I even get into this, I just want to start by saying that I plan to report on this as objectively as possible. I don't know these people, I wasn't there, but they did make it the general public's business when they chose to post it all over social media, so my intention with this video is to do a deep dive into everything that we know so far so that hopefully we can learn from this. Especially because while I do believe that some of the accusations that were brought forward are valid, some of them just seemed almost desperately and distastefully curated in order to be a part of the conversation. Addressing the issue of the bandwagon effect when it comes to these viral accusations is an important part of making sure that valid accusations are not muddied down and having their credibility cheapened by these fraudulent pylons. It was only last October that we lost another beloved member of the cosplay community who went by the Inquisitor after he took his own life after similar accusations were levied against him that turned out to be false. Then, just this last month, Wanya Johnson, also known as Angry Reactions, announced that he would no longer be portraying his beloved character who appears visually terrifying while hilariously saying incredibly kind and wholesome things, stating that the character just wasn't the same after he was recently arrested and faced felony charges for domestic violence, which were dropped on discovery that the accusations were false. These are situations where even though the men turned out to be innocent, the damage was still done. I think it's incredibly important to take our time with these things. It's irresponsible to either instantly believe or instantly doubt accusations like these. In every case, a thorough investigation is necessary. That being said, let's get right into the case of the Paladin Project. Our story begins with a man named James T. George and his project, The Paladin Project. Not to be confused with the private nonprofit corporation, which ironically exists to combat crimes against women and children, this organization is totally unrelated but very likely catching hellish trays right now. I wasn't able to find out much else about the guy besides the fact that that's his name and this is his project. I did find his IMDB page, so it is known that he is an actor with a few credits and that he seems to specialize in Renaissance Festival cosplay and short films. And he's garnered quite a following online, boasting a quarter of a million subscribers on TikTok and almost 50,000 on Instagram, and appears to be a pretty beloved character in the cosplay community. His growing popularity within the community and his love for filmmaking eventually inspired him to attempt crowdfunding his personal passion project, which has already raised over $10,000. In James' own words, the goal of this project is essentially to allow him to drive all across North America making different film projects with all kinds of different cosplayers. I actually had heard about the Paladin Project sometime last fall before any of this went down, and I remember my first impression of it was honestly... Okay, so he's a fuckboy who drives around in his van to make content with hot cosplay girls. Basically, the whole niche is I'm a guy in B-list armor who makes a bunch of sexually charged shorts with hot cosplay chicks. Look, I don't hate it. I don't love it. I just kind of saw it for what it was very early on. But I also know that this stuff does appeal to people. I actually used to host pub crawls at the Renaissance Festival long before I did any of this, so I'm familiar with the culture. It's basically an adult playground for horny theater kids. The booze is ample. You will meet some of the most amazing, creative, life-changing people at those things, as well as the shadiest motherfuckers. But his project did appeal to people. For a lot of people in the cosplay community, it seemed like an awesome opportunity to showcase these characters that they'd spent years curating. 
I will also say this about my first impression of the project. It did give very you'll be paid in exposure vibes. I'm just saying I didn't see anything in the GoFundMe that mentioned how he would be paying any of these creators or anything about preserving intellectual property. So if a guy in a van is ever like, hey, let me use your unique character that you spent ages curating on my channel where my character directly changes the canonical timeline of your character's story, you should, you should really get some kind of agreement on the terms there. I will say in these creators' defense, though, that James does have a special skill set when it comes to making edits that make the character's powers come to life, such as shooting spells or fireballs. So just being able to see their characters in that way with editing skills that these people may not have had on their own might make it worthwhile enough for that to shoot with James. Also, literally none of the people involved have complained about money, so if they don't care, I don't care. Like I said, personally, the project isn't for me. I feel like most of the money is probably gonna go to like four different child support orders and three different zip codes, but other people were loving it. That is, until February 9th of 2024, when a woman named Golden would release a video that would change James' life forever. Please do not support the Paladin Project. I have been needing to make this video for a while, so please hear me out. James has exhibited a series of predatory and repetitive behaviors regarding femme-presenting people, including sexual harassment, assault, and unfortunately, in my case, rape. The video is pretty long, so I'll give a brief summary, but I will be linking it down below if you want to watch the whole thing. In this video, Golden is very open and honest about the consensual sexual relationship that she had with James. She does not shy away from this detail at all. The very specific issue and experience that she has with James occurred on a night that they were filming together in July of 2023. On this night, Golden states that she very clearly told James that she did not want to have sex that night. She states that James seems to understand and says that they should just drink instead. At this time, it's important to note that neither of these individuals are minors. They are both grown adults of drinking age. They begin drinking tequila, which Golden states she's never had before, and she also states that she's drinking on an empty stomach. She expresses that James was particularly encouraging of her to drink, saying she needs to drink more if she wants to feel it. Before long, Golden was drunk, as was James and she states that despite her previously vocalized concerns that she was not interested that James did indeed proceed to in her own words have sex. Golden goes on to say that while she didn't feel great about what happened she did decide to move past it and continue to have a consensual sexual relationship with James for months following. That is until she discovered that James had a hidden secret long-term partner and they kind of fell out. Golden says she tried to move on with her life and leave this in the past until someone told a similar story to her about James trying to get someone drunk and lure them back to his van. Golden also cites another video that someone else made trying to warn women of James' predatory behavior. She is referring to this video made by a Miss Sky McSparkle, but we'll get back to that later. These events inspired Golden to make her video, calling out James, making the accusation she did, and putting out a call to action to defund the Paladin Project, believing that it inherently put women in harm's way. And Golden's video went viral. Before long, it had hit 5 million views, and the effects were pretty quick. James' videos were immediately flooded with hundreds to thousands of Justice for Golden comments, and he began to lose thousands of followers. But that wasn't the scariest part. James also began immediately becoming inundated with pretty credible death threats, some of which were supported by people he considered friends and who had personal information on him. This all prompted James to record and release a five-part series about the accusations, with as much evidence as he could possibly collect detailing his relationship with Golden from the minute they met all the way up to the accusation. This is also obviously pretty lengthy, so I will also have this linked down below and I'll just hit the main points. In part one of James' series, he basically builds on the case that he and Golden had a very consistent, mutually consenting relationship. And he provides a lot of graphic evidence for this by way of sexting conversations and video, which I don't fully blame him for given the circumstances, but given that Golden also corroborates the consistent consenting relationship part, I think that we can just establish that this part is true without needing to know the details of their freaky business. I will say this though, I will never be able to unread the sentence, 
my guts are yours and thank you for the thorough gut rearranging those are gonna stay with me and i'll also say this about james evidence it doesn't just show a semi-consensual relationship it shows golden literally throwing herself at him asking him to leave bite marks and bruises to be more aggressive all the while he continuously checks in on her boundaries to make sure she's okay What's also important and credible about these text messages is that they do take place during the time frame that Golden said the incident took place. This is also where James provides some pretty damning evidence because he does have a text message conversation that seems to take place either on or around the date of the incident where James checks in in the morning asking if the night prior was worth it to which she replies, I'd do it again in a heartbeat. Meaning if this message was indeed sent the very next night after, I would consider that as an affirmation that he did have her consent the night prior. As James' video continues, he addresses Golden's claim that he was deliberately hiding a long-term partner from her by basically saying that he had to because Sarah wanted him to keep it a secret. Now, it's completely valid to keep a relationship on the down low if that's what everyone agreed to. I think the term for that is a sneaky link. But you can keep someone's identity private while still being honest and transparent with someone that you are indeed seeing other people. But James feels he was clear on this, and based on some of the text messages he presents, including where she says that there's no strings attached, and this conversation where they discuss how their relationship doesn't have a label, I would personally agree that there is no reason that she should have ever felt any sense of exclusivity. And the evidence that gets brought up by some other people later on just is not enough to suggest that James has ever promised exclusivity to anyone. In part two, we get to where Golden finds out about the Sky McSparkle video, so let's talk about that for a second. As with all of the videos, it'll be linked down below if you want to watch the full version. But in this video, Sky basically says that while she and James had no romantic history or tension whatsoever, his womanizing behaviors still had a negative effect on her in their gaming community. Sky basically details that every time a new girl would join their gaming campaign, they would get close to James, then get their hearts broken and leave the campaign, and this would just keep happening over and over again. She kind of paints him as this like hump and dump tornado that just left a wreckage of broken hearts across their campaigns. And she pretty much wraps up the video by saying, yeah, look out for this guy, ladies, he's bad news. It's also important to note that she makes no sort of claims of essay or anything like that, just that he kind of uses women. James' defense here is essentially that Skye was really reaching to wring out any clout she could from his growing channel to promote her own. And I will say he does provide some kind of damning evidence to support that. This is how Sky McSparkle responded. Um, and again, remember all the things I was saying about like on brand for her. Um, this is the very beginning of her intro to what she was going to talk about in response to uh, Golden. Hi. So instead of making a TikTok about I'm DMing my first mini series today, which I'm going to shamelessly say that right now before we talk about something serious. I want to thank Golden. Who does that? The part where James doesn't look very great, though, is when he says to Golden, I believe I told you it was only a matter of time before an attempt was made. I don't know about you, but I think most of us don't live our day-to-day -day lives just waiting for the other shoe to fall like that. Like, I have a pretty popular channel myself, and at any point in time, I would be horrified to find out that anyone was making accusations or videos like that about me. I am never expecting that. However, James states that, having worked in some marketing with her in the past, that this technique is pretty on-brand for her. He doesn't exactly give any examples of this behavior. If it were true that she had a history of trying to discredit other competing channels, that would make sense, but I just don't see any evidence of that. Her shamelessly plugging her own campaign when addressing the golden accusations, though, is pretty cringy and part of the whole bandwagon effect that I want to address. It's just never a good look when your support of a victim includes self-promotion and centering yourself, but sadly, we'll actually see more of that later. Part two goes on to elaborate more on when Golden and James fell out. James shows us that shortly after Golden and Sarah met and she became aware of their sort of long-term partnership, 
Golden made kind of this grand gesture of pouring her heart out to him, basically saying everything but I'm in love with you, but you can tell she's in deep. The most notable line from this exchange, I would say, is this part here where she says, you always make me feel safe. Considering this happened long after the inciting incident at the heart of all this, this does help James' case of having a long storied history of enthusiastic consent and trust built. But shortly after Golden left it all out on the floor like that, they actually developed what James would call bad air between them. In his words, this was due to how Golden began to treat him and others. And based on a video that Sarah would make later on, it does sound like Golden was behaving pretty crappy to people. I'll get back to James' video in a minute, but this is part of Sarah's video that she made defending James. Again, Sarah is the mysterious, secret, long-term partner that no one knew about even though they all knew about her. Sarah doesn't provide much evidence to help support James other than her belief that he's a good guy, but she does have this to say about Golden's treatment of her at that time. You had just never seen me before. You had just not seen James and I together. And despite the fact that I paid for your dinner, you barely acknowledged I was there. In fact, the only words that you looked me in the eye and told me were some weeks later at a renaissance fair where I paid for every one of your tickets to go. At the end, as the fair was wrapping up, you were speaking to two fans, getting pictures and giggling and laughing. They walked away saying, you better ride him real hard. And you giggled and said, I will. And you turned around and you looked me in the eye and you said, watch out. And walked away. Yeah, if this is true, it seems like Golden is being extremely antagonistic and nasty for no reason. And it does kind of reveal that under the mask, Golden has the potential to be a nasty, spiteful person. Now, to Sarah's point, I also always tell people you can't buy loyalty. It was very nice of Sarah to buy her tickets and her food, but that doesn't put Golden under any obligation to be nice to her. Whether Sarah bought her tickets or food, Golden still shouldn't have mistreated her, so she didn't even need to mention that. Anyway, July turns into August, and Golden and James are still not having great vibes, they're not hanging out, they're not really talking, and during this time, he actually starts to make some collaborations with a new girl named Maisie. Much like the James and Golden collaborations, these were a bunch of sexually charged, romance-based shorts. And much like Golden and James, Maisie and James began an enthusiastically consenting sexual relationship. This can be confirmed by videos they've both posted to each of their social media accounts. James kind of flies through this period because it is kind of irrelevant, but don't worry, she will make sure that it actually is very, very relevant later on. Don't worry, we'll get back to that. During this time, Golden and James stay semi-chill without much interaction, but in January, they would get into it. James hears a rumor that Golden resents him because she thinks that he's been taking credit for her success, so he tries to address these, absolutely incredulous and clueless about what she could be talking about. Golden clarifies and confirms that she does indeed resent him for this. She additionally accuses him of doxing her government name to others and basically ends their relationship over this. James attempts to reassure her that he has no memory of this, that it wasn't his intention, but she never responds. One month later, on February 9th, Golden released her video about James. This is when we begin to see a pretty big influx of videos responding and hopping on the Paladin Project hashtag. As part of this influx of responses, James began receiving a lot of threats against his life. One of the most concerning and disturbing, though, was when Tank Tolman himself, a creator with over 2 million followers, endorsed this comment calling for James to be made subject to the Blood Eagle, which is a form of ritualistic execution by way of torture. As a massive creator, please by all means show your support to Golden if that's what you want to do, but you have to understand as well that you are in a power of influence to actually get someone killed like that. I do not condone Tank's response here at all. One of the biggest sentiments echoed by a lot of these response videos was essentially, how dare anyone ask for details or proof? Your only job is to believe the victim. And personally, I have mixed feelings on that. I definitely don't think that anyone is entitled to details or proof of someone else's trauma, 
But I also don't think that anyone is entitled to being 100% believed just because you say something happened. I think it's a very dangerous precedent to set, and I don't think it's fair to shame people for wanting to see an investigation before they believe an accusation. While most of these videos were simply people trying to show support for Golden, this is also where we start to see the bandwagon effect. I don't think there's anything wrong with making a video to show your support for a person. I do get skeptical when your involvement either centers or promotes yourself using the drama. I also get skeptical when someone tries to make themselves relevant by providing evidence, but the evidence appears to be completely manufactured. One of the women who ended up making several videos using the Paladin Project hashtag after this all started going viral was a creator who goes by The Forest Shade. In her videos, The Forest Shade provides proof of James' creepy behavior by showing conversations where James appears to be just absolutely ham-fisting sex into conversations where it's not wanted. And based on the conversations she shows, including one where she looks like she's just brutally rejecting him, James looks like a desperate horn dog. Unfortunately for her, but more importantly for the credibility of the claims made against James in general, James manages to totally debunk the idea that his sexual advances were unwanted by showing a whole text log of conversations where she is also hitting on him and even sending pretty lewd photos. And this was really disappointing to see because there was no need to cherry pick and manipulate evidence like that just to show support for her friend. Instead, it just looks like she fabricated a narrative so she could be included. But what was even more disappointing was the involvement of another even bigger creator who goes by Maisie Linney on TikTok. As I mentioned earlier, Maisie also had a physical and business relationship with James in the time after Golden and his collaborations and before the accusation. Very quickly after Golden's video went viral, Maisie made her own video, which she released on TikTok, Instagram, and YouTube. Gotta love the Mama Maisie hashtag coming before the Justice for Golden hashtag. Very classy. Chances are, if you follow me, you've seen some of the stuff that we have done together. And while I did not suffer sexual assault at the hands of James T. George, I am able to relate to Golden in his carelessness with people's feelings. James and I never had an official relationship. We were physical and he told me he was single. Single and polyam. And so when I caught feelings for him and I did, and I caught them hard, um, and he leaned into them, endorsed them almost and never corrected me, never, never paused, never, you know, never kind of gave me a heads up. So it hurt a lot when I found out that he had had a partner the entire time. Now this part is really important because until I saw Maisie's video, I had believed through everyone else's account that James was incredibly reckless with not telling people that he was polyamorous. But Maisie's video single-handedly proves that James was incredibly open and honest about his sexuality and his romantic disposition. The fact that she had the audacity to go from saying she knew he was single and polyamorous right to she had no idea where they stood with each other is so frustrating and misleading, but that's not even the most annoying part of her video. I also wanted to show people the person that James is. I went through old videos of us because I wanted to find those moments where his mask slipped. So this is basically just her admitting that she had to troll through tons of footage to find absolutely anything that could potentially make her look like the victim, but the evidence that she does cook up is bogus. For people to see just how easy it is for him to manipulate people. As a warning before I show these upcoming clips, they might be triggering for some people. Uh, I will have a timestamp for when these clips are over. I also think it's important to note before watching these clips that I am a survivor of not only sex but also have various other traumas that come with their own set of trauma responses. And James was aware of these at the time that these were filmed. We're filming a scene where um, my character takes off her hood and then covers it back up. And James didn't like how I was playing my character and he wanted to get a better shot. So without my consent, he um, decided to startle me. Part of my traumas and how they manifest is I am extremely jumpy and I don't like loud male voices. So you can hear him make a noise at me and you can see just how startled I was. Hey. 
This one is crazy to me. It is glaringly obvious to anyone who watches this that the whole point of this scene was for her to be startled. I mean, she is reaching for the stars, trying to say that James simply going, hey, was an aggressive and manipulated tactic designed to play on her triggers and create some kind of power dynamic. Huge reach. But hey, she did manage to get the big spotlight she wanted in this shit show after that. Her video received almost as many views as Golden's did at the time, and when James made a response to Maisie's video, it performed better than all of the five other videos before that combined. If her intent wasn't to direct attention away from Golden, it certainly wasn't the impact. Now, James' video does do a terrific job of tearing Maisie's video apart limb from limb. All right, so I said that I was going to talk about Maisie separately, so... I was really disappointed and frustrated when I saw the approach you were taking in your video. Um, you had to stretch incredibly far to try and be relevant to this conversation and to try and convince yourself and confirm your stance to support Golden. So we're going to break down what you've chosen to present. You base a lot of your... Uh, argument and frustration around the idea that I told you I was single um, and you found out that I had a partner the entire time. Um, we've had several conversations where we openly talk about our situations and what we want in relationships and you even went on to explain one friendship you have where the other person is in an actual serious relationship but you just mess around and it's no big deal because you're friends and you're attracted to each other and all that. So firstly, don't pretend like that's suddenly a consideration of yours. And to pretend like I haven't openly stated that while no, I'm not in any official serious relationship, but if I were to consider it, it would be Sarah. Um, and to now state that it hurt when you found out that I had a partner the entire time, you make it sound like you only just found out there was the possibility of other people and that there was some sense of exclusivity between us this is a text message from september 13th so decently early on in our friendship um, i believe we were on one of your streams and we were building our guardians i think somebody was making a joke about like they're making theirs look like their future wife or future husband and i was just saying that i was just me mean i'm not actually making mine look like my future wife i've never actually put in much effort into my gardens and you laugh and then i state my actual future wife if i were to ever consider it again is the lovely lady sarah who is just too good to me and has my heart as much as i joke about dummies and step on me or could kill me and all that Tender, supportive sweethearts are the ones for me. And you say that's gay. And this was your reply to that. Again, this is September 13th, timestamp there. Um, and you say, see, I figured, to be honest, in regards to it being Sarah. And you said, that's adorable. She's the fire lady, right? And to try and make it sound like you were pursuing a serious relationship with me and I just manipulated and led you on, that's not the dynamic we even remotely had. Again, you were blatantly open about your other situationships or other pursuits so what at all about our relationship should have led me to believe that you were pursuing me somehow differently like that's just what i do i literally get most of my pajamas from every single time one of my male friends visits i collect them like a little crow like a little raven but you don't see this you don't see this champion of feminism commenting and being like, oh, wow, it just seems like Maisie's using her streams or content creation to try to get all these handsome men. And I got to confirm from because it's like, where do you find all these attractive men? And I'm like, hell, <laughs> I don't know. But like, that's the thing that's bugging me is because she could easily say the same damn thing about me. Easily. That's a lot of my stuff. That's why I held back on flirting so much on my streams and why I was like, oh shit, I love this energy because I wanted to do that energy with you on my streams, but I was too scared that like, I was coming on too strong because I do the exact same goddamn thing. Dude, collecting clothing from people as like relics of your conquests is freaking wild, man. Just collecting dudes like Pokemon cards. Based on this evidence, why would Maisie ever feel entitled to exclusivity? And if it's true that she was boning someone's man whose partner wasn't okay with it, then she should know that karma doesn't owe her exclusivity, period. Anyway, as a result of this, the only thing Maisie manages to accomplish is making James look more credible. 
But do you see what I'm saying here? Maisie was essentially caught red-handed trying to fabricate problems that were easily disproven just to make herself irrelevant to a viral issue, which backfired because all it did was make James look great. Especially when her grand follow-up response to James was posting this very weak screenshot with clown music playing behind it while promising to make an even bigger follow-up video. And in my opinion, this conversation doesn't prove that James lied to or manipulated her. If someone tells you that they're single and polyamorous, there is no rational reason for you as a grown adult to assume that means they don't have anyone else important in their lives. If you're one of those people that believes that James is just being attacked by bitter, vengeful ex-lovers who feel scorned, Maisie did a really good job of painting that picture for him. I don't think she helped Golden at all. I think all she managed to do was disproportionately shift the focus away from Golden and onto her for no good or well-intentioned reason. Now, to the best of my research, those were the two other big victims of James. There are two other videos that mention some kind of rumor about James preying on someone, but there is nothing upon which to found those claims. But in my opinion, the only stories that really matter here are Golden's and James. There have been no other claims of SA outside of Golden's, so let's focus on that one. We heard her side, we heard his side. Now, the only thing that we can really do to logically draw our own conclusion is use what they both agreed on. We're really just gonna focus on the SA allegation. I really don't care if James sucks at letting people know that he's for the streets, that's not illegal. The biggest issue is that James is being accused of the R word. That is deadly serious. So let's look at what we know for sure. According to both Golden and James, on some night in July of 2023, neither of them are sure which, but it had to have been between July 1st and July 12th, both of them drank tequila and penetration occurred. Golden states that at the beginning of the night, she clearly stated that she did not want to have sex. James does not corroborate this account. In fact, according to private messages, James expands further on this by saying, there was never a time where she said, I don't want to have sex tonight not once during any of their time together. James does agree that he was, in his own words, pushy at first, agreeing that he did tell her she needs to drink more if she wants to feel it, but this is where their accounts diverge. James states that at this time, Golden began aggressively and almost competitively pounding back shots in response to him saying this. He said after that, he did tell her to slow down and pace herself. And according to both of them, neither of them blacked out. Based on both of their stories, we have no way of figuring out whose blood alcohol was higher or who drank more. And because of that, the situation gets extremely complicated, especially legally. Legally, it is true that a person is unable to provide consent if they are under the influence of drugs or alcohol. So it's true that Golden could not consent and true that James could also not consent. Due to the fact that they were both intoxicated, the next factor that a court would typically consider would be if one of them was incapacitated and the other was just intoxicated. Incapacitated meaning incoherent, unable to tell what's going on around you, unable to communicate properly. Neither Golden or James indicate any signs of having been incapacitated that night. Now there are a lot of people insisting that one factor that makes James guilty is that he gave her the alcohol and therefore it is his fault she got drunk. And I just wholly refute that argument. Golden is a fully grown woman above the legal drinking age. She has agency, she has autonomy, and she certainly has the ability to say no thank you. Golden provided no reason for us to believe that she was forced to drink against her will, under duress, or under any threat at all. James did not get Golden drunk. Golden got Golden drunk. Let's make that very clear. Another argument that people are using for why James' inebriation gave him more power to consent than Golden's inebriation is that James was the one doing the penetrating. However, this is an incredibly flawed argument because men can absolutely be the victims of MTP or made-to-penetrate assault, which can occur to men while inebriated. If we set the standard that anyone who does the penetrating is automatically to blame, we erase an entire world of male victims in the process. All that considered, is it really fair to say that a man is always guilty of SA whenever two drunk people have sex? Because to me, that's a very dangerous, very slippery slope. 
Do you know how many women I know who love to get tipsy with their man and take him to Bone Town? A lot. And if I have to tell every single one of them that their husbands belong in jail, it's gonna be a rough year. The final and most important factor is whether or not Golden actually stated that she did not want to have sex that night. According to Golden, she states that she very plainly told him that she did not want to have sex that night. Variations of her account include the sentence, I'm not feeling up for anything tonight, then the statement, he had sex despite the no I had given, and then finally her statement, I denied it multiple times. If you believe Golden's account, then this was in fact S.A. The consent was revoked, and due to her inebriated condition, she was unable to grant it back. The consent should be assumed to be fully revoked until she is back to a sober headspace to where she can consent again, no matter what drunk Golden says. However, if you believe James, Golden has never once expressed at any point in time in their relationship that there was ever a night that she did not want to have sex. James actually speaks to the opposite, saying he was actually the only one who had ever expressed there being a time he didn't want to have intercourse due to stresses in his life, which he provides evidence for. The only thing James says that he can possibly remember, even close to that, is that she did mention that she might be starting her period soon, to which he replied, it's fine if they do stuff or don't. And this does align with her statement that she was cramping that night. And I do wonder if this was kind of a miscommunication issue where Golden maybe thought she was being more clear than she was. I think a lot of people assume that we get what they're saying through certain implications. Maybe in the past, all of her exes knew that when she said that she was about to start her period, that it was an automatic no or off limits time. And she's not used to dudes who are ready to earn their red wings. But again, I have no clue. I can only speculate. I was not there. And in regards to the consent, I really can't stop thinking about the text message that James provided earlier that seemed to reaffirm that consent had been given the night prior by saying, I'd do it again in a heartbeat. This is where it would be really helpful to know when the exact date that this occurred was. According to James, video was taken on Golden from that night, so if she still had the video, she would be able to pull up the metadata, but it is also perfectly understandable if she deleted it. But it begs the question, if we did find out the exact date and you found out that that text was sent the morning after, would it change your mind? Due to this gap of information, however, the only choice we really have is deciding who to believe or not, if we choose to believe anyone at all. When it comes to who's more credible, they both seem to have a lot of people on their sides and a lot of people vouching for their crappy, selfish behaviors. When it comes to motive, we have no proof that either of them had malicious intent. Of course, James has the motivation to defend himself, as any man would. But what motivation would Golden have to lie? Sure, maybe she is just a scorned ex-lover who wants to see James fail, but it's equally as likely that she honestly believes that she was clear enough in her communication and that her boundaries were violated and that she has a right to warn other women. And I do believe James has womanizing tendencies, and I do believe that James has a responsibility to remove alcohol from his business model. But I do not think it is fair to say that any time a drunk man has sex with a drunk woman that he is automatically guilty of S.A. I do not think it's fair to say that whoever is capable of penetrating is automatically a guilty party when two drunk people have sex. I don't think it's fair to insist that we all automatically agree that someone is guilty of SA just because someone says they are. And I don't think it's fair to imply that people should feel bad for wanting evidence or proof before making such a radical judgment on someone. That being said, and I'm saying this as a purely objective statement, not because I endorse the truth of it, but it is not illegal to call someone a racist. If Golden wants to come online and say, I think James T. George is a creepy predator who should be avoided at all cost, she has the legal right to do that. She's allowed to warn people not to associate with him, and she's allowed to tell people that she doesn't think they should donate to his project. She is allowed to interpret that night exactly as she interpreted it. But Lauren, what about defamation? I mean, that's certainly an option. I just don't think James has a strong case for it. First of all, he's living out of a van. He doesn't exactly have Johnny Depp money. Second, in order to prove defamation, James would have to prove that Golden is lying about that night. And since neither of them are able to properly prove anything about that night, 
neither of them have any case for any litigation. And it sucks. It sucks that some things can be so tremendously difficult to prove. But I don't necessarily think that that makes the court of public opinion a more fair or even remotely thorough format to gain justice. The main reason I wanted to cover this case is because I think that we as a society are just way too loosey-goosey with how we handle serious allegations. Especially when it's pretty clear that not everything is always as it seems in these quick TikTok videos. Creators are being paid like never before, and there is a constant pressure and incentive to get views and clicks. As a result, the bandwagon effect from these viral accusations can often turn into a feeding frenzy where everyone's just chomping at the bit to try to be relevant to the drama. So much so that we now have creators doing Cirque du Soleil levels of manipulation tactics to get their hands in as many viral pots as they can, no matter how distasteful it is or how muddy it makes the waters. I want to stress that you can still be a good person just because you don't immediately believe everything you're told, especially if you also choose not to engage in harmful and threatening behaviors toward the accused person when all you have is a word. I also want to stress, as always, the sheer importance of enthusiastic and sober consent. If it does not feel like an emphatic yes, it's a no. This applies to every gender you could possibly think of. No matter how you feel about the situation, do get all of your thoughts and frustrations out in the comments down below, but please do not go to any of the previously mentioned creators' pages with any hatred, bullying, or ill intentions. If your intention is not to support any of these creators, please leave their pages alone. That's about all I have to say on the situation, but I know the conversation is far from over. What factors do you think should be considered when deciding who can or can't consent when both parties are drunk? Do you agree with believe all victims operating under the assumption that most people would never lie about something like that and it's just safer to believe them? Do you think less of people who won't or can't believe accusations? And do you agree that bandwagon pylons are a problem when it comes to the culture of viral accusations? Thank you to everyone contributing to this dialogue in healthy and reasonable ways. As you walk away from this video, please remember to always ensure that you are doing everything in your power to make sure that you are a safe person to be around, and everything in your power to stay safe.